Um, you know, it was a pleasure in San Diego uh, to give an award to Hal Holbrook. And it was a delight in Minneapolis when we were able to um, shine a light on Garrison Keillor. And coming to Nashville, we asked Stephanie Silverman, is there anyone uh, in Nashville that you think would be deserving of the Marquee Award? This is not an award that's an automatic. We don't give it out every year. We didn't, and, and in fact, if you remember, we didn't give one out in New York. Um, it, there has to be a special reason, and there has to be someone truly um, willing to um, make it happen. And so Stephanie said, I have just the person. And she said he's a delight to work with. And earlier tonight, he told me that his life is short. His goal is not to be uh, low maintenance. It's to be no maintenance. And I promise you, he's been, uh, according to Stephanie, no maintenance about joining us tonight and receiving this award. So Stephanie, do you want to come up and do the honors? <laughs> to our winners, the statues were shipped to Nashville. Your name plaques that go on the statues were shipped to Baltimore, <laughs> where offices are. So just like the Oscars, you've got to give your statue back. We'll have it personalized, and then we'll ship it to you directly. <laughs> that's right. That's what it means to be famous. You don't have to carry your own award. Oh, I broke it. I am not. This is, oh, okay. I didn't break it. Okay. Um, so, first of all, I want to say just to second Ken about the staff. People keep saying, oh, you gosh, you must be tired. All the Belcourt staff, they must be, they must be working constantly on this. And we have not been. This staff, of El, the LHAT staff, Colleen, Tisha, and Ken, who doesn't give himself enough credit, work tirelessly on this. And it couldn't be a better team to work with when you're the host because you don't have to do a lot of work. So um, there's a little secret for all of you great theaters and great cities. Consider being me sometime in the future. Um, but to the business at hand, uh, the League of Historic American Theaters Marquee Award was established recently, as Ken said, in 2012 to honor artists whose work not only inspire League members, but also showcase um, the beautiful historic theaters that the League works tirelessly to restore and maintain, that we all do every day. The recipient of this award will be a celebrated artist whose name has lit up the many historic marquees of our member theaters. So once we knew that the annual conference was coming to Nashville and that we'd have the opportunity to honor one of the many extraordinary artists who live and work out of this wonderful city, the very first person that came to mind was Vince Gill. Vince is iconic in the way our buildings are iconic, and I don't mean that in that you're old, um, but, but in, the, in that he is an artist with an original voice, with something special to say, but who is profoundly rooted in the history of the music he loves and that has made this community and that has touched communities across this country. Vince is no stranger to awards. He's won 20 Grammys, 18 CMAs, and is an inductee in the Country Music Hall of Fame. He has sold more than 26 million albums. That's a lot of albums. Um, but each of those is brimming with great music, wonderful collaborations, and that sense of curiosity and celebration that a great artist brings to their work. Um, as the mayor alluded to, he cares about community deeply and is actively philanthropic. And engagement ranges from the great uh, All for the Hall concerts that you may have had the opportunity to attend that support our Country Music Hall of Fame to, um, a, real, to a new initiative that I was reading about when, when I was, well, cyber stalking you to do this. Um, and, and it is as ambassador um, to the New America's Best Communities Competition, which is encouraging investment in rural America. And I know that many of our theaters are on the main streets of rural America and really know what it means to serve those communities as they prosper or struggle or are trying to find a way to move forward in this modern world. So I, as a girl from Nebraska, am very touched by this initiative and really appreciate the attention and, and the intent behind really uh, helping rural America thrive. So he is, at his core, a good guy. And, and no maintenance on top of it. So we, the members of the League of Historic American Theaters, are thrilled to be able to honor you, Vince. We are the lucky people whose lives are filled with the stewardship of our historic theaters, uh, whose stages are the places where the now evolves into the then and where generations of audience members commune with the artists and the art that they love. Those audiences love you. And if rooms could talk, and sometimes they can if you ask people about their ghosts, uh, they definitely claim you as a favorite. And so do we. 
Thank you for making our stage as a home for your music and thrilling our audiences with great playing, great songwriting, and just being you. It is my honor to present the 2015 League of Historic American Theater's Marquee Award to Vince Gill. Thank you very much. I had to look around when they asked for you guys to stand up of who was doing really good this year. I couldn't help but notice it was all people that had theaters that I didn't get booked at. Um, <laughs> all kidding aside, uh, this means a lot to me. Just meeting some of you earlier tonight and just getting to, um, to put faces with, with some history is, is always a good thing. And, and, you know, we need each other at the end of the day. We really need each other. You guys, because of what you do, you provide a stage for me to have that voice that she was talking about. And, and if I didn't have that stage to have this voice, I wouldn't get to do what I do. And, and thinking about receiving this tonight, it's, really, it's been really touching to kind of go back and, and relive um, a lot of my life because... I think over 50 years ago it was, I went into my first theater in my hometown of Oklahoma City. I was born in a little town called Norman, but grew up in Oklahoma City. And as a little boy, I got to go see my hero uh, play music live, and that was Chet Atkins. And I couldn't have been more than six or seven years old, and, and I wanted to play music and did play music. And, and so the first time I ever saw someone on a stage, it was my hero. And um, that, that building is really, really special to me because I've, I buckled down and I learned to play and I learned to sing and joined the little bands in, in junior high school and high school and things worked out pretty good. I'm starting to feel like Madonna here. <laughs> 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 Had another one, I'd be set. But... Um, <laughs> um, but I... I put in the thousands and thousands of hours in my room trying to learn to play and trying to learn to sing. And I wound up on that very stage where I saw Chet play. Uh, I was probably a 16-year-old kid. And I'll never forget it because um, I got to play there a couple of times while I was still in high school. And the first time, uh, a little band we had was fairly popular locally. And we got to open a show for uh, Pure Prairie League. And I was just young kid and and we had a really cool band and and we did real good that night and we jammed with those guys and and I wound up in that band six seven years later I wound up being a member of Pure Prairie League and touring extensively with them for several years and I'll just never forget the first time I got to play on that stage what it meant when you finally got to have the conversation come back to you that's what music has always been about it's really about having a conversation with someone if it, if it comes back, it's like the conversation gets to continue. And it, man, it, it lit the biggest fire in me you could ever imagine. And then I'll tell you about the second time I played on that stage. And maybe some of you have heard this story. But uh, our band was pretty popular locally. And we got a call about 3 o'clock one afternoon. And they said, is there any chance you can get your band together to come down here and open a show for us? The opening act has canceled. So we called around and we got enough guys to make a little bluegrass band and, and headed down to this same Civic Center where I saw Chad as a little boy. And the first time I got to play there, this was going to be the second. And I pulled down there and I saw on the marquee who was appearing tonight was Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at that and I said, man, that's got to be a really bad typo. You know, I said, there is no way that they're going to have us open for KISS. Maybe we're playing like a Shriners convention down underneath or something, and they need a hillbilly band to come down there and play some banjo and fiddle songs. And, and now, sure as hell, we had to open for KISS. <clears throat> and we, we got out there. And mind you, this is only the second time I've ever really played in front of a 
a big crowd of people. And we, the, the, the humor of this story is when we got up there, you know, they had their, they had giant risers, you know, a 30 foot drum riser and blood and guts coming out of it and <laughs> amps stacked to the ceiling and this and that. And we come out there with our little mandolins and our fiddles and, you know, we looked like, you know, like tinker toys compared to what, what was going on there. And we only lasted about two songs, you know, and, and, and this, this crowd was ready to be painted and rock and, and we were up there moaning this high lonesome bluegrass stuff and they were madder than hell. And, and, and so this, this crowd completely turned on us and they were all, they were throwing beer bottles, anything they could get, they were throwing at us and every one of them was like violently booing. I mean, like, it was like you were the, 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 the wrestler, the bad wrestler that was going to beat the champion, you know. And it was, it was still to this day one of my favorite things I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> but I, I, I just said, hell, it's, it, could only go, it could only get better from here, you know. But uh, anyway, we had, a, we had quite an experience there. And, and then I left home right after I got out of high school. And, and little by little, I tried to come and play in as many places as I could with whatever band I was in and what have you. And, and to this day, you know, it's, it's amazing to me. But, but these theaters are, are my favorite places to play. They always have been. And I'm not saying that because you've given me this award. Um, and I had, a, I had a nice stretch where I could sell out big arenas and, and all that. And as I look all, the, all these years back, I don't remember those. I remember these sweet little theaters where you had a great crowd and people were connected. And, and I think it's going to be my lot for the rest of my career because I'm certainly am not going to sell out an arena anymore. And uh, I have a pretty good, pretty good handle on what I'm supposed to do. And, um, and I, I love so many times, I mean, I'm going to tell this one story. Um, because it means so much to me. I, I adore the Ryman Auditorium here in Nashville, and you're going to get to see it tomorrow. Um, that place was built as a tabernacle in the late 1800s and, and is a magical place, and, and why I love it so very, very much. And it seems appropriate tonight that you've given this award to Garrison Keeler because the very first time I got to play in the Ryman was in the 80s, and I did it with Garrison Keeler and Chet Atkins. But uh, just a, a word of thanks once again as a musician just trying to play and sing for you guys to, to give me the opportunity to come and, and uh, share what it is that I do with people that, that like what it is that I do. Um, you're the conduit that, that makes it all work. You give me, you give me a voice, and uh, I've always been grateful and always will be. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, I just asked Stephanie if she wanted to stay on stage and give out the statues, and she said she could be that girl, so. Okay. Oh, I forgot. When I first started, I should have recognized that we do have a sponsor for our award ceremony, Ever, Evergreen Architectural Arts. Not only did they sponsor tonight's event, but they provided these statues for our awards. They've been providing the statues for, for years. So thank you to Jeff Green and Evergreen Architectural. All right. Next up. Outstanding Individual Contribution. The Outstanding Individual Contribution Award recognizes an individual who demonstrates vision, dedication, selflessness, and excellence through his or her contribution to historic theaters and their communities. The recipient of this award will have demonstrated excellence through his or her significant contributions, the impact of his or her services, and breadth of population served, and the length of time and or intensity of contributions that benefit the field of historic theaters. Grab my note. Now, I tried, I wrote this a hundred different ways, and I could not figure out how to speak about this person and keep it a secret until we revealed at the end, because you're going to know instantly as I say some of these things. So I'm just going to let you know 
that the winner of this year's award, Mr. Jim Bowes. <laughs> Many people know that Jim grew up in a town of 500 people in Vermont. What most of them don't know is that he was born in Amityville, New York. One of the reasons for moving to an obscure, out-of-the-way place, as his mother states, was because Jim was the original Amityville whore. Jim was always entrepreneurial. His early fascination with puppetry led him to write and perform puppet plays in a stage he built and also sold lemonade at intermission. He knew where the money was made even as a child. He also wrote and performed numerous plays in elementary school, not surprisingly, also being the lead actor and director. Little remains of these early works, except for maybe the scarred linoleum in Mrs. Haight's third grade classroom and an oh-so-exaggerated scar on Billy Bettleston's temple. These are stories from Jim. And Jim was not exempt from technical mishaps either. During a puppet show, he wrote and was performing in the two-room schoolhouse for the town's bicentennial celebration. The smoke effect was so successful that it required an immediate evacuation of the countless children, strollers, and panicky parents. And nothing could persuade them to return for the big finale, to which Jim says, Philistines. Jim had the perfect credentials for working at the Nederlander organization. Previously, he taught elementary school in South Central Los Angeles, as well as having worked, and I stress worked, in the locked ward of a psychiatric hospital. In addition to the stellar productions Jim likes to list on his resume, there are some lesser known productions that grace the Nederlander stages, some of which may or may not have actually been inspired by Jim. These include Cry Baby, Scandalous, Hands on a Hard Body, and The Blonde and the Thunderbird. Jim served four and a half months on a mob trial. This is a true story. One night at a, din at a dinner, while Jim was naively sitting with his back to the door, the theme song to The Godfather started playing, and everyone else at the table instinctively dug, dove, dove under the table. Now, I could go on about drinking and drugs and dresses. These words. Oh, you know what, hell, it's an Elhot conference. No one's going to care about that. So what I'd like to do instead, you know, when, when we give out this award, we actually go to previous winners uh, to be the jury or the panelists to decide who's going to win the award. It was terribly difficult to put a panel together this year because so many of the previous recipients of this award wrote letters of recommendation for Jim's nomination. So then the next step was to go to previous past board presidents to see if they would sit on the jury panel. So many of the previous past board presidents wrote letters of nomination for Jim that I couldn't get a panel. I finally did find four individuals who somehow had not written a letter of recommendation for Jim. And um, they told me unanimously, why are we even gathering for this? You should name the award for the man. So what I thought I'd do to bring a little seriousness to the award, Jim, is I'm going to read to you the letter of recommendation that your dear friend and our dear friend at the League and the previous recipient of this award, Joe Rosenberg, wrote. So this is Joe's letter. It is with pride that I write this letter of support for Jim Bowes being considered for El Hat's Outstanding Individual Contribution to 2015 award. When Jim joined the league in 2002, question mark, he wasn't quite sure, many El Hat members felt that the league had arrived because someone famous had become a member. Jim was held on a pedestal, and rightfully so, because his reputation as vice president of the Nederlander organization. Jim's first El Hat conference was in Miami, and it was quite obvious to me how deeply his colleagues respected him. The first time I got to know Jim was during the league's fabled trip to Cuba. As I had dinner with him, I realized what a special person Jim was, well beyond his work with Nederlander. When Jim began working with the Nederlanders, it was an organization which owned and operated many historic theaters across the US and Canada and the UK, and yet had the reputation of not spending resources on the maintenance and restoration of its properties. Jim was very, very instrumental in getting the Nederlanders to change their way of thinking and to start caring about and spending money on their architectural treasures. Jim successfully led the Nederlanders to becoming one of the leaders in renovating and restoring historic theaters. Jim has directly overseen the restoration of at least five historic Broadway theaters, the Brooks Atkinson, the Lunt Fontaine, the Palace, the Neil Simon, and the Nederlander. He has also been influential on the restorations of theaters outside of New York, including Hollywood's Pantages, 
Chicago's Oriental, San Francisco's Orpheum, and London's Alwich, uh, among others. After Jim joined El Hat, his combination of gentleness, kindness, organizational skills, ability to foster ability to foster inclusivity between peace, people of desperate opinions, dic dedication towards historic theaters brought him into what was probably the fastest trajectory in the league's history from new member to board member to El Hat president. As a member of the league, Jim has been very helpful in bringing in new members who over the years have helped the league immeasurably, financially, and in many other ways. Jim was absolutely selfless with the amount of time he spent with his presidential duties and obligations. He went far beyond the call of duty in getting, including emotionally, involved with the El Hat members, board, and staff. Jim, being the special person he is, has been the only board president to show his emotions and cry in front of a board meeting. I don't remember the circumstances, but I do remember how that moment brought home to the board members what a very unique person Jim is. Even while Jim was going through a very trying period in his life with many very important losses occurring in a very short period of time, Jim continued to be at the service of the League and to the historic theater movement. The League of Historic American Theaters would not be the organization it is today without the years Jim was at its helm. The historic theater movement would not be where it is today without Jim's work with the Nederlander organization and with El Hat. The number of people who have sat in have enjoyed the benefits of theaters which have been renovated by Jim is in the millions. Jim has been directly and indirectly, indirectly one of the leaders of the historic theater movement. I hope you will consider Jim for El Hat's 2015 Outstanding Individual Contribution. Sincerely, Joe Rosenberg, 26, 20, 000, 2006 Honoree Outstanding Individual. It is with great pride and pleasure and joy and everything else that goes in with recognizing a friend like Jim to introduce all of you once again to our dear friend and the winner of this year's award, Mr. Jim Bose. I'm like, you just can't get enough of seeing a grown man cry, can you? I've been away from this position for a couple of years, and I guess perhaps it's time. <clears throat> but for all you first-time people, you'll learn soon enough. I, I thought I was referred to as Mr. Fawcett because of my abilities to raise money for the organization. Uh, no. It seems <laughs> it seems I have a very different rep. So just to, get out of, just to get it out of the way, for you newcomers, during the conference, somebody's going to bet you how many words is it going to take to get Jim to cry. And I'll tell you right now, save your money, buy raffle tickets, <laughs> because the answer is five. Hey, Jim. Remember the time <laughs> I do, that was so great. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> Vince just said, mm, check please. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Gosh, um, I still think of myself as the new kid here even though I'm realizing that this is now my, my 15th conference since that July in New York City in 2001. But this is one of the special things about El Hat and its members and this conference. Every gathering is like the first day of school. We're in a new place with new people, new ideas, new problems, new solutions. And the best part is, we're all welcome. There's no, there's no click that shuns you. There's no, you won't, be, you won't be sitting alone at lunchtime. 
There's no fear of being penalized or going to detention unless you don't buy a raffle ticket. So <laughs> here we are. We're on the cusp of our first day of school. And yet at the same time, I do remember those 15 conferences and those 15 years. Time does pass. Accumulated experiences over time becomes history. And we are, after all, the League of Historic American Theaters. I mean, ideally, accumulated experiences will bring wisdom, and really, hopefully, wisdom without ego, so that our accumulated wisdom gives us a stable foundation to look upon things in a new way, to recognize the ever-changing world in which we live in, the changing habits, the changing tastes, the changing mores in each of our communities. But it's not sufficient that it just be individual accumulation of experiences. For what will we be without the accumulation of shared experiences? Isn't that one of the driving forces for us doing what it is that we do? We facilitate shared experiences over time to nurture the creation of a shared collective. We are a league. We have a covenant made between us for the promotion of common interests for mutual service. Some of the best moments of my life have been spent with people in this room. And now, tonight, to be included amongst LHAT members Maureen Patton, Tony Rivenbar, Joe Rosenberg, Craig Morrison, Janice Barlow, Killis Amon, Andrea Rogers, Jeff Green, Dulcie Gilmore, Ted King, and Michael Price, well, this is an honor that I shall cherish to the end of my days. I know some of them are here, so would some of the recipient, those prior recipients of this award please stand so that we can acknowledge and thank you again for the work that you have done for this organization. Because these folks, these folks, ladies and gentlemen, they represent the very best of the heart, the soul, the knowledge, the passion, and the tenacity that makes this organization so dear. And believe me, there were plenty of challenges in the early days of historic preservation. Um, in, in getting ready for this, I was looking over some old documents from early conferences, from early sessions that were being uh, held, and some of the topics that they had to tackle. And I'd like to share a few with the topics that they had to deal with. Open air theater, or how to save a fortune on your roof. <laughs> <laughs> The art of the get without the give. How to turn rodents into experiential extras. <laughs> Consultants? As if. How do I fill my mid-mezzanine? And that's about flooring, not patrons. <laughs> my favorite one is... <laughs> Seats are for sissies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this one, and extortion, or turn your raffle into a windfall. 
Hey, wait a minute. Uh, hmm. Anyway, listen, anybody who's been a recipient of an award such as this or who has worked with somebody receiving such award knows that it's a result of hard work by many, many people. The countless board members who gave immeasurable time and resources to further the aspirations of this membership. The staff of El Hat, particularly JP, and Colleen, and Tisha, who always had at the ready an extra mile to run for us. And it was a blessing having the guidance and counsel of two of the finest executive directors I have met and worked with, Fran Holden and Ken Stein. Each, each has a well of skill sets and knowledge that were and are exactly what was and is needed at the time, and we are all the better for it. Ah, oh, Fran. Ken Stein. <laughs> Fran. Fran Ken Stein. Ah, oh, Frankenstein. <laughs> Fra Frankenstein. <laughs> My God, what have we done? <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you're going to get picked on because your name. Oh, no, not here. And of, listen, of course, I wouldn't be standing here today without the generosity and the teachings of Jimmy Needlander. Jimmy, God bless him, 93, he has always been a risk taker and has always been willing to give someone a chance. Oddly, the chances he'd been giving people always had nothing to do with any experience they had in the past. So he really went out on, on, on that. When I, look, when I was originally interviewed by my staff there on numerous occasions, they finally said, we really like you. We'd like to hire you, but we have no idea what to do with you. But... Jimmy always had a belief of just go with your gut, and then together we'll figure it out later on. And that is such a, such, I find, a key that stays with me through the work that I do now, as well as his notion of thinking, thinking the unthinkable in order to get to the best conclusion. You know, when Rent was closing after 13 or 14 years at the, at the Needleland Theater, the Oftentimes, the emergency lights would go on during a performance because the wiring was so water damaged that uh, it seemed to just short circuit at will. And then on top of that, the vibrations from the music of the, sh of the show caused a lot of pieces of plaster to fall from its mooring. So at the end of its final performance in thunderous you know, cacophony up north, I was just pushing people out of that theater as fast as I could because I was afraid somebody was going to get clobbered with another piece of plaster or fall over some crumbling piece of concrete. And I'll, I have to tell you, I actually raised the prospect of tearing that theater down, building a state-of-the-art modern theater with offices for a permanent home for the Needlelander organization. Kind of heretical, yeah? Especially when I was president of the board of the League of Historic American Theaters. Yeah. <laughs> but actually contemplating the demise of that theater made us look inside again and again and again and again to see what there was that could be saved or what was hidden there or what we hoped would be there that we could, we could, we could save. And obviously... 
And there's a very happy ending to this story because the Needle Ladders Theater restores one of the jewels of his chain. But let me tell you, that theater was not without its troubles. They wanted a dumpy theater in 1996, which they got, and then the damn show ran about 13, 14 years, and you can only imagine the shape of that theater by the time the show closed. And so I was given the task of renovating and restoring it in 12 weeks. Weeks. And the fire escape. Yeah, the fire escape. The fire escape was literally held up against the front wall of the theater by external conduit that had been run over the years to get lights to different parts of the front of the building. And that was all that was holding up the fire escape on the front of the building. And the street level facade had been covered in plaster lath, painted in electric green, and was, well, that architectural masterpiece was like porous and crumbling apart and filled with graffiti and names that everybody wanted, you know, scratching out, you know, the history of rent, blah, 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 blah. Well, Roger Morgan and I stood out there one day, and we were looking and looking and just wondering what we were going to do. And I just said, why don't we tear it down and see what's behind here? And at this point, my facilities director was behind me, jumping up and down, turning like horrible shades of white. And But we tore it down. Unfortunately, in the renovation in the 1950s, there were large columns with beautiful decorative molding, stone molding around. And in the wisdom of the 50s, it had all been literally hacked off so that clean, lined, smaller columns could be put yeah, in its place. And so there we were standing at a building that had literally been an axe and hammer had been torn uh, and taken and, and torn apart. And, and they took, they took an, a doorway that had gone to an office and made that a closet for the box office and they moved the box office a little farther down into what was an alley with like swinging saloon doors. But their heights were all sort of different. And so what you ended up with like walls that didn't connect and walls that didn't connect not only to other walls, but walls that didn't connect to other ceilings. Um, the whole thing was just a mess, and by now the facilities man is just in, in, in lather on, on the ground. And, and Roger and I stood there, and looked at it, looked at each other, and we looked back at the building, and Roger said after a moment, what the hell are we going to do with this? And I looked at him and I said, I don't know. But the box office is open the next week. <laughs> well, Jeff Green and his team did a remarkable bit of work, and the entrance has been reconfigured, and the walls and ceilings are connected. And they did an absolutely beautiful job, except now I know Jeff is somewhere out here saying, don't tell them I did it in one week. <laughs> but if it hadn't been for Jimmy's let's try it attitude, you know, we would have never thrown caution to the wind and, and dared peel back like some horrible, rotten thing in order to find some other horrible, rotten thing behind that we would... That, well, well, you know what I mean. But anyway, his staff, Jimmy and his staff taught me more about leadership and loyalty and management that they will ever know. And again, I just have to thank a few more people. And then, but I also am here today because of the love and belief of my family, of my sisters, Marianne and Melanie, and my dear friend Sally, who have been there and stayed through thick and thin. And to my dear friend Chacha Musa, later, uh, who has but who has been there always and all ways, who never doubted, always knew when to ask questions, 
and help me remember one of the most important things in life, which was to be how to have fun and how to be silly without shame. And to my dear, to my mom, whose strengths and beliefs I still aspire to to this day, who many years ago in a conversation I had with her that was so fraught with fear and anxiety, she was able to be so calm in her wisdom and compassion and say to me, it doesn't matter to me who you love. What matters to me is knowing that you have the capacity to love. And that, and so I have to thank my mom for that and for so much more. And six months until your 90th. And one more, and to Sean, who more than anyone in my life has made me look at myself and what I see and what I think I see and what I don't see and has allowed me to walk with him in his footsteps and see a whole other world out there. I love you, Sean. Oh, God, it's late, and it's a school night. Um, I used to start out my mornings in Needlelander with Susan Lee, and we would, we would start the morning saying, what hornet's nest are we going to poke a stick at today? Huh. Well, my work, my work at the Needlelanders is done. But I still find myself picking up that stick every now and then, twirling it around, wondering. Then I remembered meeting somebody a few years ago who introduced herself to me by saying, hey, when are we going to take on the world? And I thought, she seems like one of those nest pokey type of people. And not just that, she's probably the kind that builds and brings with her a, a new and improved tie for all those homeless hornets. So I was inspired to hitting the road again. She and I pokey poked sticks at the ready, but in a caring and nurturing way. We'd be like, we were thinking, of, we'd be like, we'd be like the Ghostbusters, but like theater busters. And then we thought, oh my God, that's like a horrible name to describe us, especially with this group. Or a theater, something like theater or, or ghost light busters or, or, or something to that. No, it still was too like bustery, you know. Where's the care? Where's the nurturing? Third, theater, theater, theater nurses? Well, that's probably not the best choice to go with either. But theater doctors. Yeah, theater doctors. And after all, a lot of people in this room can attest that Margaret and I both have great bedside matters. And so, Margaret Lake, when are we going to take on the world? The when is now. Now is when we lead, searching for the how. How do we see through the minutia of specialization and how do we bridge the languages each one creates? How do we balance integrity of space with real life changes and social habits and our notions of experiential entertainment? What happens when tradition becomes mere replication of artifact? How will we facilitate new forms of experiences and communication with a society that is becoming farther and farther removed from direct contact with the natural world? How fortunate we are to work in a field 
that so many aspire to and that inspires so many. What a wonderful world. This is for you, Dave. And my deepest thanks and appreciation to all of you and this wonderful organization. And please, please, if there's anything you take of this, remember, don't ever postpone joy. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Any of us expected any less from Jim? <laughs> this um, next presentation for the Outside Historic Theater has sound, so let me get hooked up real quick. All right. Wouldn't you hate if that happened during one of your shows in the theater? <laughs> the um, 2015 Out Outstanding Historic Theater. The Outstanding Historic Theater Award recognizes a theater that demonstrates excellence through its community impact quality of programs and services, and quality of the restoration or rehabilitation of its historic structure. An award-winning theater will have demonstrated excellence through significant achievement, the impact of its services and breadth of population served, and the length of time and or intensity of its activities. I think I can delay the reveal on. So our 2015 Outstanding Historic Theater was built in 1922. In 1959, it was slated for demolition. Luckily, a local patron and philanthropist purchased the grand house for an undisclosed amount and then immediately turned around and gave it to the city for a dollar. In 1983, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. In 2000, it completed a $16.7 million, $16 million renovation, and other projects over the next five years brought that eventual total up to $24.3 million. In 2011, another $717,000 in renovations were done to the physical building, including doors, windows, and restrooms. With 2,567 seats, today the goals of this venue are, one, to be the premier performing arts center in the region, two, to be a cornucopia of diverse popular events, and three, to be recognized as one of the best theater rental venues worldwide. So how are they doing with their goals? Well, every year since 2000, it has made Polestar Magazine's top 100 list. Every year since 2006, it has received Facility Magazine's Prime Site Award. Today, it will join the company of other outstanding historic theater winners like the Fulton Opera House, the Cutler Majestic Theater, the Hawaii Theater Center, the Flynn Center for the Performing Arts, the Newberry Opera House, Proctor's, Playhouse Square, the Fabulous Fox in Atlanta, Palace Theater Trust, New York City Center, and last year's recipient, the York Theater. If you represent one of those theaters and you're in the house tonight, if you'll stand up so we can remember and... <laughs> so now I could just tell you who the winner is, but instead I thought we could reveal that with a video. So if you will pardon my technical naivete. Let's see if I do this right. The Morris has the hottest tickets in town in northern Indiana and southwest Michigan for a wide variety of national touring stars, concerts, comedians, and shows. The magnificent Morris Performing Arts Center is a restored 1922 vaudeville house with a seating capacity of over 2,500 and a new stage house. Located in South Bend, Indiana, between Chicago, Fort Wayne, Cleveland, Detroit, and Indianapolis, the Morris is serving over 1.8 million people within a 45-minute drive. The venue is in the heart of the downtown arts and entertainment district with nearby hotels and just 10 minutes from the I-8090 toll road, South Bend Airport, the University of Notre Dame, and five more college campuses. The Morris is consistently ranked in Polestar Magazine's Top 100 Theaters Worldwide based on ticket sales and has been voted for the Facilities Magazine Prime Site Award by over 10,000 booking agents, promoters, and talent buyers. 
complimentary in-house event marketing support is included in the venue rental. The Morris displays upcoming shows on its 32-foot wide Dactronics LED marquee with electronic messages viewed by 50,000 people in vehicles daily. Three Grand Lobby TV monitors display event messages during all shows. Printed posters, produced in-house, are displayed in four exterior cases. Events are promoted online through social media on morriscenter.org, Facebook, a Morris smartphone app, fan club email blast to over 15,000 members, and posted on numerous community online calendars. Morris event flyers of upcoming events are printed and distributed to area businesses, museums, and attractions. We've designed and equipped the Morris to maximize load-in and load-out options while optimizing backstage access. There are three load-in docks, including two with dock levelers and one with van access. The load-in docks have direct backstage access. Backstage, you'll find everything the visiting crews need to work safely and effectively, including a fully automated Serapid Orchestra pit lift. The Morris is a beloved historic landmark and its interiors have been restored to their original 1920s splendor. The ornate main floor, mezzanine, and three balconies have a capacity of over 2,500 seats. The box office is located at the theater front entrance and has five windows to handle walk-up and phone ticket sales. Tickets are also sold at three ticket outlets and online 24 hours a day, seven days a week on the morrissetter.org website and through Facebook. The Morris is the hottest ticket in town and perfect for all types of events. To book the magnificent Morris, call 574-235-5901 or find us online at morriscenter.org. Please join me in congratulating the executive director, Dennis Andres, and the staff at the Morris Performing Arts Center in South Bend, Indiana. Dennis? How do I follow Jim? And Vince, uh, and yes, you have performed in our theater, and we'd like to have you back. But we know you're there. Um, boy, I knew I was getting this award, but all of a sudden I'm like, wow, this is amazing. It's an amazing award, and thank the award committee for identifying the Morris Performing Arts Center as El Hat's 2015 Outstanding Historic Theater. And my staff and I are, are humbled to receive this award. A special and well-deserved thank you goes to Mary Ellen Smith sitting at the table as my director of marketing and promotions for the Morris for creating and putting together the nomination materials. And to all the dedicated staff members of the magnificent Morris, I thank them for contributing to make us shine. Our ornate theater, as the promo piece said, originally opened in 1922 as the Palace Theater, and it was South Bend's newest venue featuring vaudeville and silent movies. The theater is listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1985, and the Morris is the largest historic theater in the state of Indiana surviving today, with 2,500 permanent seats plus additional seats put in the orchestra pit. In May of 1998, the building was closed to begin an extensive renovation and restoration project and reopened in the year 2000. Quickly do the math. Yeah, the theater was closed for 26 months, a little over a year, two years, and it was considered dead. The uh, promoters had disappeared. The um, events disappeared for that, minute, that length of time. To the agents and, again, the promoters, the Palace Theater, renamed the Morris Civic Auditorium before renovation restoration and now called the Morris Performing Arts Center, it has three names, was dead and buried. We didn't exist to anybody at that point. But we fought our way back in, uh, with a vengeance. We now do uh, all the things that you can possibly think of, from rock, gospel, country, pop, 
comedians, rap, dance, symphony, Broadway shows, wedding receptions, and commencements, etc. We issue over 100,000 tickets a year and generate over $1.5 million every year in revenue. We are a rental facility. The restoration allowed for a brand new stage house which could accommodate large shows such as Phantom of the Opera, Wicked, which we've had in the building now for several weeks, Jersey Boys, and we'll have Book of Mormon showing up uh, beginning uh, in about three months from now. The total renovation of the complex, including the Palais Royale Ballroom, which is the adjacent building next door, in the year 2002, the total amount, as Ken said, was $24.3 million. The renovation of the Morris alone was $16.7 million. And then I must tell you that approximately $8 million of that $24 million was raised by the citizens of South Bend and the surrounding area. As we all know, maintaining a historic theater is perhaps the most difficult part. And in the past 15 years since renovation, we have continued to maintain and enhance the theater by adding various things such as the Serapid pit lift um, and an electronic marquee. And currently we're looking, we did uh, energy efficient windows and doors that have been added. And now we're looking at two new projects. One is putting solar panels, leasing the roof's surface and putting solar panels in to reduce the expenses on heating the building, the electric costs. We're also taking those uh, in the video you saw, there were four panels out front for the holding three sheets. We have found a company that will produce a digital panel that will fit inside there, and we'll be able to put all four of them with digital panels. So we continue to look for ways to upgrade the building. And last but not least, Ken, a special thank you to you for all your help and the extraordinary leadership of El Hat. And thanks also to your staff and all the LHAD members for their friendship and willingness to help each other to grow and to prosper. Thank you again, and I graciously accept LHAD's 2015 Outstanding Historic Award. Thank you. to see what time breakfast was in the morning. Okay. <laughs> it's time to go night-night. we got to be up at 8 o'clock in the morning for breakfast and networking, so let the games begin. Thank you again to all of our sponsors, to the sponsor of this ceremony, Evergreen Architectural Arts. Thank you to our recipients, Vince Gill, Jim Bowes, and the Moore Performing Arts Center. Thank you all for everything you do every day to save your theaters. I think you know how much I loved my historic theater when I worked there. I can't wait to learn this week about your theaters and learn what you're doing. So let's have a great conference, and thank you so much, Stephanie, to you and all of Nashville for hosting us. Good night. Good night.